G'day, how you doing? Adam Williams here from Easy Way Photography. In this video, we're going to take a look at this image here and all of the layers here that make up this image that take it from the raw file there to that finished file there. Okay, so you can see a quite dramatic change, but it's really only very simple processes that all step together to uh, form that rather dramatic change and rather, well, hopefully, a rather dramatic image at the end of the day. So we'll go through all of those layers in just a second. Just a little bit of a background on the image itself. It's an aerial, as you might have already guessed. Actually, if we zoom in, you will see these little tiny birds here, which are actually pelicans, which is an enormous bird, as you well know. So that gives you a sense of scale of this particular formation here. It's actually extremely large. And I believe it might be a salt deposit. Obviously, the image itself is taken at Lake Eyre. Oh, well, not so obviously. It was taken at Lake Eyre, where there's a lot of salt that comes up through the earth. Um, and I believe this might be salt and potentially formed by the wind blowing in one particular direction. I'm assuming sort of down in this direction from the top left down to the bottom right there and maybe as the salt starts to build up similar to a sand dune it might start to build up in one deposit first and then I'm kind of thinking that that slightly changes the wind patterns to bend around that initial deposit thereby creating these arc shapes because there was there was just heaps of these little uh, white and red arcs uh, in this particular region like maybe maybe 50 60 or 100 of them in this particular region. Uh, so that was quite interesting, these really abstract formations. And as you can see, I've managed to capture one zoomed in at full frame. I believe I, at this particular time, I think I was shooting with the Nikon 24 to 70. So it was probably zoomed right in at 70 mil to try and capture as much of this particular detail in one frame as possible. Now I was out at Lake Eyre working on a project with the Light Collective. The Light Collective has been putting together a project as part of our broader RGB project, our Red Green Blue project, which is an Australian landscape photography project where we target specific locations and then go out there as a group and try and tell the story through our eyes. So our very first project was Lake Air. Uh, the project itself is just called Cat Eye Thunder Lake Air um, and it's part of our Red collection of projects. So we've got the red, the green and the blue. I won't go right into how we define those particular areas. Essentially they're just segments of Australia. So the red is Central Australia. The green is kind of the band between Central Australia and the coast where you would find the rivers and the forests if you like. And then the blue is the coastline. Okay, so that's our RGB project. We haven't yet chosen our next project but it'll likely be one of the green or one of the blue locations that we're looking at. Uh, I was lucky enough that over the weekend at the Australian Professional Print Awards that this image was well received by the judges and they awarded it a 95 points out of 100, which is a gold distinction, which is just incredible. Almost brought me to tears with some of the words that they were uh, describing my image with and the kind of emotions that they were feeling when they were viewing my image I found to be very emotional myself. So before we jump in and go through all the individual layers, just indulge me for a second. I'm going to take you back to the day and replay as the judges are beginning to challenge and score this particular image and I'm sure you can imagine how that was a really moving experience for myself. Scores 89 uh, and I've got two challenges but I'm going to take Angie's um, at 92 um, so Angie you've got 97 96 uh, sorry let me try that again 87 86 88 and 91 um, as well as your 92 
This image has incredible emotional impact. It's like an abstract piece of artwork and it's really not until you go up and look really closely into it that you can even understand what it is. But even, I mean, we all just sat in, in, a, in awe of it when it turned around. If anything, I think I underscored it. It should have been gold distinction. It's just incredible. It's so well seen. It's the, the author has brought it, taken us to a place that's so, it's new. I mean, it's an area, but they've seen it in such a creative way. It's like a, to me, it's like a splash of paint almost. It's like they've painted us a landscape. So abstract, but so beautiful. All the details are there if you need something to latch on. There's little tiny details in there. Everything there, everything's there. It's just incredible. So if anything, I think it should be gold distinction. James? I totally underscored it. And as soon as I pressed submit, I regretted it uh, because I love it. And the reason why I love it is because it's got a real haunting quality to it. For me, I thought it was uh, like an Aboriginal cave painting. So that painting reference again, totally gets you. Um, I, I see figures in it. I see like a ghostly figure coming through it. Um, and then when you're getting close, you can see the subtleties of the landscape. A few birds in there, a few cheeky little birds. Um, yeah, so the detail is just immense. Um, and it, just that isolation of, of the red and the white paint is just you know, superb. So, yeah, no, it's a gold without question. Just how high is the question? David Evans? <coughs> yeah, I was shy too, and I did the same thing. I went, oh. So I'm really glad we've got this opportunity. Um, I'm definitely coming up. I've never seen, never ever seen this, these colours in an aerial before. I just haven't. So in terms of what we ha haven't seen, and now I'm seeing things that James is seeing with haunting image coming through, those birds are exquisite, exquisite, not only that, but the shadows of the birds. Printing all that, that black could not have been easy, um, whilst retaining all those little details. So yeah, I'm, I'm coming up by quite a way. Greek looking? Yeah, I scored this 88, and uh, again, it was one of those submit and you went, what am I doing? Um, I agree just with everything. Um, I think, arguably, um, I just want to I just want to go there, you know, um, and, and just see this amazing place. Uh, so yeah, I've underscored it for sure. Melissa Anderson. Yeah, I'm I'm already on gold, and it, you know it's stunning. You know the printing is phenomenal. I actually saw it as you know both a snake, an unhappy face. I think the the beautiful thing about this image is you see so many different. Um, different stories from it. Um, it raises so many questions, but it does have those anchoring points, and the, the you know, the, the presentation is phenomenal. So, yeah. Angie, you have a right of reply? So I think we're all in agreement. I mean, this is the most innovative, outstanding image that I've seen today, and I think I've, I believe I've underscored it, but I would love to see it go as gold distinction. It, it is in a level above its own. It's just so incredible, so so different. The author has presented us something that is just, it's incredible and worthy of a gold distinction. So please come up. Okay, so we are going to hold Angie's score at 92. And when the judges are ready, they are going to rescore. Ninety-five. Gold distinction. Well done, team. Excellent job. So we're back here with the image and all of these layers. Thank you once again for indulging me and, uh, and allowing me to show you that very special moment of the APA weekend. And let's take a look. As I said, this is the raw file here. So you can see all of the information is actually within this file. Now, as a photographer, I am not concerned with reality one bit at all. And I guess some of you might find that a little bit confronting. But that's my personal philosophy. I don't force that on anyone else. Within my own photography, my main goal is to create emotive images and tell emotive stories. Now, this image is a little bit different because it's so very abstract um, that I think you can draw many different stories from that. So I'm not 100% even within myself exactly where the inspiration for this particular style of image came from. 
I just love this boomerang shape and I loved all the textural detail that started to emerge from the background when I started to draw out and increase the contrast. That was incredible. I do remember having this kind of feeling of an old weathered blackboard and this beautiful abstract white and red brush stroke like a painter or an artist had just dipped a huge brush full of paint and just quite sloppily swung that across the canvas okay so that was kind of the main inspiration I wasn't really sure exactly what the art shape was supposed to mean within that interpretation um, but it can mean many different things to many people so I guess that's the beauty potentially of this particular image all the details there and again if we zoom in you can see we have the beginnings of that beautiful kind of brush stroke texture that I'm talking about and even some of these red kind of colors are kind of dripping down even down through here so let's jump in now with my imagery and when I teach Photoshop and teach photography to my students that very very simple techniques can come together to make quite complex dramatic high impact images and I think again with this particular workflow or these particular layers that you're going to see they're all extremely simple techniques I do have one kind of or maybe two kind of uh, little tricks up my sleeve that I'm going to show you uh, but the rest of those techniques are very simple so let's jump in and take a look the very first layer is an auto curves layer something that I learned from Peter Eastway a number of years ago and you can see straight away I guess a lot of my inspiration as I turn that on and off has come from this one individual layer and if I just turn that off for a second and we'll just go ahead and add another curves layer and all I've gone and done is click on the auto button at the top right corner here and you can see that hasn't had a really dramatic change but if I hold down option or alt and click on auto again so option on a Mac or alt on a PC you can see we get this auto color correction options and at this stage for me I wasn't really too sure of where this image was heading so it was just a case of flicking through these and it just happened to be that they were making huge dramatic differences in this image and you can see that right there so I've gone and chosen one of these ones I believe it was probably that slightly reddish warmish one there you can turn on those snap neutral midtones they're not doing a lot in fact I think it might have been the slightly more greenish one that I chose originally and then we just go ahead and click OK now all of these techniques that I'm running through in this particular video you can obviously learn at easywayphotography.com uh, it's not quite launched yet um, but keep your eye out on that particular site and uh, if you're interested in any of these techniques or my workflow or many many other techniques and learning resources check out easywayphotography.com and the great thing about easywayphotography.com is it's photography education specifically for landscape photographers okay so if you're interested in that make sure you go and check that out now I'm going to go ahead and delete this curves layer there we go and there is that particular curves adjustment there in fact it looks like I did choose that slightly warmer one rather than that greeny blue one moving up we have another curves layer and you can see in the properties panel here I've just added a contrast adjustment so a two-point curve pulling up those highlights and it's moving up into that top right corner okay so you can see that just kind of pulling out a little more of that detail and that contrast in that top right corner as we move up to the next curves layer and you can see we've got several curves layer very simple and even the masking is just soft brush masking no technical masking just simply soft brush work and adjusting those curves okay so the next curve here you can see we've softened those blacks by bringing that point up off the blacks a little and then also brightened up those mid-tones there okay so in actual fact you can see kind of like an oil stain kind of a feature in here that kind of darkish stain in there at this point I'm just trying to even out that exposure a little bit and kind of remove that glossy black blemish a little okay so you can see I've done that actually gone slightly over the top but in the final image you'll see that we have that kind of 
dusty, chalky blackboard feel, which I really liked. So this is how we're getting to that. And, and adjusting that black point up is one way to get that dusty, black, chalky effect because you're essentially taking your blacks and reducing them to greys. Moving up to the next curves layer, you can see we have a darkening curves layer here, just dragging that one point down. It's an overall layer, you can see the white mask, so it's affecting the entire image. Okay, and you can see already, we're getting quite close to kind of the feel of the finished product. It just requires a little bit more finessing, obviously. The next curves layer, again, darkening down, this time just masking that in a little bit. If I hold down Option, you can see that soft brush mask there. Um, and it will just be balancing out some of the tonalities and some of the bright spots in the image here. You can see, particularly down in this region, a little bit of a bright spot just sort of here and here. And you can see I'm starting to just smoothen out the gradients across the image, which is something I like to do uh, in a lot of my images, or in fact, almost all, I would say. The next step here, I've just merged all the layers up. So that's just a case of clicking on that top layer in your layer stack. And at this stage, this would be my top layer. And pressing on a Mac, it is Command, Option, Shift, and E. And you can see that takes all the information from the layers below and produces that one flattened file there. On a PC, that shortcut will be Command, Alt, Shift, and E. I'm just going to delete that one there because I already have that there. Now, the reason I have produced this merged up layer at this point is I wanted to take the file into NickFX and see if there was a little bit of stylization that I could add to this image or a little bit of color toning that would really give the image a bit more drama. Now, as it turns out, I'm not sure I used too much of this particular style. Although you can see that it's really adding to the grainy kind of weathered texture of that background. So definitely that was an aspect of this particular image that came from this Nick FX filter right here. And you can see it's the classic camera. Um, in fact, if I just click on there, classic camera for AEP2. Okay, so let's see if we can go into Nick FX and find that. So just clicking back on that stamped up merged layer there. If I move up to my filter menus, come down to Nick, and I believe it was probably one of these analog effects, classic camera, something or other. Let's take a look. Here we go. We're in Nick FX, and yeah, there it is there, classic camera four, I believe. And you can see the way that's impacting the image and really bringing out that weathered texture look to the foreground. Now we can tweak around with all of those effects. Nick FX is currently a free download, so go ahead and Google Nick FX if you're interested in using it. The downside is it's no longer supported uh, by the owner, which is Google. Google no longer seems to support or update this particular software. So at any point, a future Photoshop update may well render this software uh, inactive. Okay, so don't rely on it too heavily but it does have some nice features to potentially maybe get a little bit more variation um, and also sometimes a little bit extra of a different kind of a color toning or a mood into your images. So I'll just press cancel because I have this uh, exact filter here and you can see the mask there. I've just painted that away from the reds a little bit so that uh, the vibrance in those reds comes right back. Moving up next, we have a selective color layer. Okay, and all we're doing here is I've moved into the cyan menu, and actually let me, once again, I'll just repeat that process. Choose selective color layer in the cyans, and just started having a little play with these sliders here, and you can see if I take the cyans right down like so, I'm getting those real dusty blacks that I'm looking for. By increasing the magentas, I'm kind of tying in the pinkish reds into those dusty, creamy whites in the background. So it's kind of tying the image together. And then I can't remember exactly what I did with those yellows, but maybe they went to the right as well, like so. Okay, so again, I'll delete that one. Oops, there we go, delete that one. Turn that one back on. And you can see we're getting those really beautiful dusty blacks that I'm looking for those weathered blacks. 
The next layer here, layer two, is again a stamped up merged copy. Um, but this time, I've used that to actually warp out this corner. That would have been because, as I drag down some rulers, because at the time the image would have been cropped like so. Okay, That would have been cropped like that. So I would have been just dragging out that strange dark vignette from the bottom left corner there. It's probably, I don't even know what that is. Um, it could be, in fact, it's likely to be part of the camera strap or part of the part of the inside of the plane or something like that. Okay, so we're just warping that out. And that's actually quite simple. So if I turn that off and just recreate one of those stamped up copy layers, like so. So all that information on one layer, we press Command or Control T, depending if you're Mac or PC, and then hold down Command or Control on this bottom left corner here. Before we click, we hold down Command or Control. That allows us just to stretch this one corner out all by itself like so, something like that. We press OK. And we've removed that vignette that way. Now we could clone that out or do a number of things, but in this case, that was the particular style that I used. Once again, I'll delete that one. Go back to the original. Moving up here, we have a color fill layer. And you can see it's actually filling those background with that really purpley color. In fact, that's a bit distracting. Let me just crop that in. Clear that crop. Let me just crop that in like so. Okay, so this would have been the crop that I was dealing with at this point in the workflow. I did change it later on. Let me just clear those guides out of the way too. So this would have been the crop that I was dealing with at this point in the workflow. And you can see I've decided to add a slight blue tone to the blacks. Um, I've also used Blend If here to blend that into a specific area. If I double click on that icon there, you will see I've, what have I done there? I've taken it out of the majority of the blacks and then feathered it quite aggressively and also feathered it out of the whitest whites. Okay, so once again, if you're interested in learning Blend If, and it's an incredible technique, really powerful, go ahead and check out easywayphotography.com. All the tutorials and information is over there. Moving up, I've got a Details. And if we zoom in, let's move into 50%, which is roughly print detail. And if we turn that folder off, you can see there's before. Now the image is not soft, it's got all that detail. Keep in mind we're looking at a kind of a mud plane and a salt plane, so the details aren't going to be overly sharp to begin with. You can see the little tiny birds are quite sharp here though. And as we turn on this details folder, look at the detail that's being extracted, particularly in this salt formation. And that's a real highlight of this particular image. Now as I open that up, what I've actually done, or actually rather than open that up and show you, let me go ahead and demonstrate. So once again, stamping up, Command, Option, Shift, E. Now the reason I do a lot of stamping up, well it's not common in all of my uh, workflows, but the reason you need to stamp up is if you need to do a filter that requires all of the pixel information, you need to bring all that pixel information without potentially flattening and losing all of those layers below. Now they do create a little bit of a roadblock in your workflow, or at least they can. But this is how you get all that pixel information to allow us to access the filter menu and in this case sharpen the image via a high pass filter. Now I'll move up to the filter menu here, down to other and then high pass. And this particular technique doesn't work all of the time. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is what I did here. But I use a very small radius, in fact sometimes Oops, sometimes 0.9, so just under one pixel there. So you can see at the moment that detail is quite subtle. If I press OK and we change this to, say, overlay, we will get a little bit of sharpening. OK, I doubt you can even see that. In fact, this little corner here, you can see it affecting a little bit. Not very much though. 
This is where the levels layer comes in. So we go ahead and select a levels layer. And I clip that down so that it's only affecting the high pass filter below. And the way we do that is either hold down Alt or Option and hover between those two layers. And you can see that little icon pops up. We click once and you can now see this little arrow which is clipping the levels adjustment down to that high pass filter. We can also do that via this little icon here. Okay, at the bottom of the properties menu, we can clip that down. Now you can see now that it's clipped down, you can see the histogram of that high pass layer below is extremely narrow. Okay, that's because it's completely gray. You can see that just here. So what we do, and this is how we can increase the detail in that layer. So if I just move back down to my high pass layer here and change it back to normal, you can see there it is in normal blend mode. And then if I start to play with the levels here, you can see those little details that we're trying to emphasize are really starting to really kind of pop out. Okay, so you can, I guess, see the way that this might assist uh, in giving this particular image that little bit of extra detail and depth to the detail that I'm looking for. Okay, so if I just change that uh, original high pass layer from grey back to overlay. And we can now turn that on and off. You can see the amount of detail, particularly up in this region here where I want that illusion of brush strokes to be, is really starting to get some depth. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and delete both of those again. Move back to the original. Okay, and it's a little more grungier, and that's just a case of either pulling these levels in further, or potentially adding a little bit more radius into the original high pass layer. Okay, so let's just zoom back out and continue up. So here we have a curves layer. Again, we're just uh, pulling those blacks up, making them a little more dusty. You'll see that when I turn this layer on, and also brightening up a few points as well. You can see again we have that kind of black oil stain throughout the image. I think it's complicating the image a little bit for mine so I'm just trying to even out that exposure or that section of the image to match the rest of the background a little better. Moving up to the next curves layer you can see just a straight single point darken. Okay, very simple. Brushed in with a soft brush Again, I'll be keeping my eye on balancing those external or background tonalities and shades. Again, the next layer, something similar, uh, another darkening curves. And once again, I'll be looking at balancing or evening out, if you like, some of those uh, background tonalities. Okay, so a hue saturation layer here. And you can see up the top the slider, we've just changed the hue of the entire image there, which is then been painted in just to affect that red area. And you can see I've changed it to a slightly more burnt orangey red rather than that magenta -y pink red there. I think in hindsight, either color works just as well. Next, we have a solid color layer in the soft light blend mode and brushed in. You can see just softly brushed in. Um, this will be trying to add a little bit of a pinkish tone into those dusty white kind of details. Okay, so you can particularly see it through here. So I want that similar kind of red color to start kind of tying the entire image together. So I'm trying to kind of infuse that into those dusty grayish whites there. Okay, you can see that starting to happen. Okay, so that's solid color fill layer in the soft light blend mode. Once again, another technique I learned from Peter Eastway a few years ago, and I find it incredibly useful. Moving up, we've got another hue saturation layer. If I click, you can see here the master menu has no change. You can only guess that we're affecting the reds, no yellows, no. Greens, surely not. Cyans. There you go. I'm trying to pull out some cyan and the blues out of this image. There's a little purplish tone 
creeping in. Again, complicating the color palette. I really don't want or need an extra color beyond the black, the red, and the white. And there's a hint of yellow in there as well. So those purples are just complicating the color palette for mine. And there you go. This particular layer is removing those from the image. Moving up, we've got a blank layer four. Okay, little tiny black blemish there. I assume it's, I don't even know what that is. It might be a dust spot. It's a bit strange, but again, it doesn't need to be there. It's a little distracting um, from the story. So that's gone. Once again, we have another kind of chocolatey warm brown solid color fill layer. And you could argue that I've taken that red straight back to where it was before. Okay, so there you go. Um, we've added that red into that particular area. We've also used Blend If to blend that in a little more naturally into that area. And then on the next layer here, we've painted that and doubled that effect up in a few of those areas. Well, I can hardly see. And look, honestly, that's not having a huge effect. So the first layer is doing all of the work there. And that second layer is not doing a great deal at all. Okay, so here's the second of my tricks on this particular image. And similar to the detail trick with the high pass and the levels before, um, this particular technique will not work on every single image. But I still wanted to add more of that kind of brush stroke depth to the main subject here. So really try and start to get it standing up off the paper, if you like. So I've never tried this before, but it worked quite well. I used the emboss filter in Photoshop. So let's once again, we'll stamp all these layers together. Command Option Shift E. On a PC, that's Control Alt Shift E. And to remind myself, I've got written in the layer above here, emboss, minus 120, four, and then if I go beyond there, it says 500 as well. In fact, you can see there, 500%. So if we click up to the filter menu, click stylize, and then, oops, and then emboss. And you can see it's roughly set at those settings anyway. Height for amount 500%. And you can see that what's happening here, it's kind of giving, you can see that, let's just zoom out a little bit. You can see it's kind of giving the image that three-dimensional nature uh, by the way that it's shading and shadowing uh, those individual details. And especially the way it's giving that extra three-dimensionality and depth and I guess presence to the main feature of this image. Okay, so not quite yet. Uh, what blend mode did I choose for that? Okay, so soft light. I've then switched that blend mode to soft light. And this is where it becomes a little tricky. Okay, so it already looks okay, I guess. Looks a bit crunchy, um, but it doesn't look too bad. But I found, and I hope it's not going to make a liar of me, but I found if we click the Move tool and then use the arrow keys to bump this particular layer around one pixel at a time, you might find that, and there, yeah, if I go one pixel down, for example, so that's where we started. If I go one pixel right, it gets blurry, one left, it gets blurry, one up. It gets a bit blurry, but if I go one pixel down, it gets even sharper in its detail and the way it has that dimension there, okay? So that was where we started. It looked, okay, so that was where we started before the layer. And then we've added that emboss layer at minus 120 in direction uh, in four pixels, I think that is, or in an in a amount of four, and at 500%. And if we turn that on, it gets really crunchy like that. But if I push, I guess it's because the directional light is coming in that kind of downwards direction. If I bump this particular layer down one pixel, you can see it really grabs that depth um, into that particular area. And if we zoom back out, you can see the effect that has on the entire image there. It really, in fact, if we zoom in a little there, you can see all the texture and the detail 
that is brought into the background of this particular image using that technique. Now once again I'm going to delete that and we'll turn on the original and take a quick look at the mask and you'll notice that we've painted in white to really bring that detail into that main brush stroke and then I've reduced the density of the mask itself you can see up in the top right here to 55 percent which has allowed the blacks of the mask to change to 55 percent grey and allowing a little bit of that effect to come through to the rest of the image but I don't want the rest of the image to be so high in detail that it's distracting uh, my viewers away from the subject. So that's why the subject contains the majority of the detail and that embossed shadowing and the rest of the background contains roughly half of that detail. Okay, so that's it there. And if we just zoom in a little there you'll see that was without the effect and then particularly keep your eye on the brush stroke in the whites here or the depth of those whites there and you can see they really get this kind of wavy nature to them. There's after. It looks a bit over the top when you click between one and the other, but it seemed to print up absolutely beautifully and gave the exact effect that I'm looking for. Okay, once again I've got a merged up copy layer here because I ended up just stretching the format and that's why the crop was different before. Okay, so that's our new crop there. So I've just adjusted the crop so that we can see the new format. And now when I turn this on and off, you'll see there was the original, pretty much the full frame image there. And I just wanted this to be a little bit more boxy of a format. And I quite like the way that the main subject began to stretch as I stretch the entire image there. So again, just using free transform um, and that particular technique of stretching and warping can also obviously be found at easywayphotography.com. Moving up, we have only a couple more layers to go here, just some very fine refinements. We've got an overall darkening layer. So you can see just that one point dragging down, darkening the entire image. Another hue saturation layer which is, what is it doing? It's just taking the saturation down mainly, oh there we go, from the surrounds. Okay, so keep your eye particularly in this top right corner. That's before, you can see it's quite rich and red and once again I want the image to tie together based on those reddy pink colors but I don't want too much color in those extreme edges because I want to really highlight the red in the main subject. Okay, so there's after, before and after. And then layer six or seven. Usually I would do my dust spots and whatnot at the, uh, uh, sorry, at the beginning. Um, but this particular image didn't have any visible dust spots at the beginning, at least I couldn't find any. And in fact, I'm not even sure these are dust spots, but because of the fact they look a little like dust spots, and look, they may well be, I've gone and removed them. And the very last layer here is something I've been playing around with. I'm not sure, it's not in the printed version, at least in the APA version, and I don't think I'm going to add it to the print. Uh, you can see up the top corner here, uh, these kind of like a skull kind of shape. I kind of figured that that might be a nice addition to wander around the print and find and I've added that extra eye there. Um, I'm not 100% whether that adds or detracts from my main subject here. Maybe it does add, just gives that extra dimension uh, to find within the print. Now something that is interesting, uh, which the judges pointed out, which I hadn't even noticed myself, um, I just got so caught up in doing what I was doing and focusing on my main subject and uh, stylizing it the way that I wanted it to be. But there is this ghostly kind of haunting face in here. There's an, I guess, that would be the forehead here, uh, almost like sitting underneath the arch here. So you've got a forehead, maybe a little eye socket, nose, at least this is the face I'm seeing. The other side of the face there and like a, a mouth kind of thing here, or at least that's the face that I'm picking up, but I'm sure other people are seeing 
potentially different features and different elements or faces within this image. Okay, so that was basically it. So if we go back down, let's just take one more look at the raw file there. There's the original raw file, and obviously when I was capturing this from the air, I was just mesmerized with this particular feature, and I, I knew, I, I still remember to this day, actually clicking this particular frame, and knowing that I had something that would really suit uh, my style of processing. Uh, that big bold subject in the center of the frame um, and then I've, I've just slowly worked through and let the image kind of lead me down this path and we ended up right here like that there something really dramatic and quite interpretive this is going to be one of the featured images at our exhibition at the light collective exhibition which will be held in Waterloo in Sydney opening on the 3rd of November. Um, I'd love all of you guys to come along to our opening. It's going to be absolutely incredible, if I may say that myself. Uh, the other three photographers in the exhibition or within Light Collective that are in this exhibition, because of course Ricardo de Cuna couldn't make this particular project due to other commitments, but the other photographers, Ignacio Palacios, Luke Austin and Paul Holan, their work is absolutely sublime. I can't wait to see it in large prints it's going to look just absolutely gorgeous so i'd love you all to come along on the 3rd of november so pencil that date in your diaries and you can always send me an email to adam at australianphotographer.com to get further information thank you once again for watching along and i really hope you enjoyed this video bye for now